To begin our analysis, let us take up the storyline in 1917, the year of the Bolshevik Revolution of October 25, Julian, or November 7th, Gregorian. By this time, many of the European, Middle Eastern, and Asian nations were in ruins from World War I. The Treaty of Versailles began being negotiated, 1919, long before the end of combat operations was officially declared, 1922. It was already being drafted by political planning committees staffed by the wealthiest bankers in 1917. This planning body was called, at the time, the Inquiry. Quote, the Inquiry was a study group established in 1917 by Woodrow Wilson to prepare materials for the peace negotiations following World War I. The group, composed of around 150 academics, was directed by presidential advisor Edward House and supervised directly by philosopher Sidney Mises. The group worked from the premises of the American Geographical Society of New York. Mises' senior colleagues were geographer Isaiah Bowman, journalist Walter Lippmann, historian James Shotwell, and lawyer David Hunter Miller. Others included James Truslow Adams. Members of the inquiry, now named American Commission to Negotiate Peace, traveled to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, accompanying Wilson aboard the USS George Washington to France. The members would later form the Council on Foreign Relations. End quote. Now, before we can begin to discuss the CFR, Council on Foreign Relations, we must briefly also view the transitionary era during the drafting of the Treaty of Versailles, which also created the League of Nations, precursor to the modern UN, on June 28, 1919. Thus, even if the inquiry group's intentions were benign diplomacy, it appears that by the time their boat reached French shores, they were hell-bent on ruling the world. We see the original membership of the inquiry group, academics, philosophers, philanthropists, geographers, journalists, historians, lawyers, etc., was quickly replaced by far more pro-war hawkish interests once they arrived to represent the U.S. and President Woodrow Wilson's 14-point plan. Quote, the American Commission to Negotiate Peace, successor to the inquiry, participated in the peace negotiations at the Treaty of Versailles, January 18th through December 9th, 1919. Frank Lyon Polk headed the commission in 1919. The peace conference was superseded by the Council of Ambassadors, 1920-1931, which was organized to deal with various political questions regarding the implementation of provisions of the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I. Members of the commission appointed by President Woodrow Wilson included Clive Day, an American college professor and writer on economics history at the University of California, Donald Page Ferrari, an American college professor with Yale University, an expert on international affairs and author who served as a secretary to Edward M. House. Edward M. House, a diplomat, politician, and presidential foreign policy advisor to President Wilson. Vance C. McCormick, an American politician and prominent businessman from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Sidney Edward Mises, an American philosopher and college professor, former president of the City College of New York, and Charles Seymour, an American college professor at Yale University. End quote. As we see now, the pro-war, hawkish globalist's perspective superseded the originally more diplomatic mission as it was intended by President Wilson. By this point, Wilson himself had become disenchanted with the political processes at the negotiations over the Treaty of Versailles and left the conference in February 1919 
to return to the U.S., placing Colonel House in his seat at the Round Table Council of Ten. Although they had been longtime friends, House betrayed Wilson's soft-hearted stance on reparations from Germany and imposed, instead, the heavy-handed sanctions on them that bankrupted the German economy and led to the rise of the Third Reich and the fomenting of a Second World War. The resultant treaty was so odious to Wilson's own original vision that the final wording was never passed into ratification by the U.S. Senate. The U.S. never officially joined the League of Nations that U.S. President Woodrow Wilson had idealized in his 14 points. Instead, the plotting of globalist political interests took the economical route to achieving its ends in the USA. Here we shall see the first meeting of the CFR was held during the negotiations on the Treaty of Versailles. Quote, the earliest origin of the Council stemmed from a working fellowship of about 150 scholars called the Inquiry, tasked to brief President Woodrow Wilson about options for the post-war world when Germany was defeated. Through 1917 to 1918, this academic band, including Wilson's closest advisor and longtime friend, Colonel Edward M. House, as well as Walter Lippmann, gathered at 155th Street and Broadway at the Harold Pratt House in New York City to assemble the strategy for the post-war world. The team produced more than 2,000 documents detailing and analyzing the political, economic, and social facts globally that would be helpful for Wilson in the peace talks. Their reports formed the basis for the 14 points, which outlined Wilson's strategy for peace after war's end. These scholars then traveled to the Paris Peace Conference, 1919, that would end the war. It was at one of the meetings of a small group of British and American diplomats and scholars on May 30, 1919, at the Hotel Majestique, that both the Council and its British counterpart, the Chatham House in London, were born. Some of the participants at that meeting, apart from Edward House, were Paul Warburg, Herbert Hoover, Harold Temperley, Lionel Curtis, Lord Eustace Percy, Christian Herter, and American academic historians James Thompson Shotwell, of Columbia University, Archibald Carey Coolidge of Harvard, and Charles Seymour of Yale. End quote. All of the original members of this group were wealthy banking magnates and industrial sector monopolists. They may have seen their aims as humanitarian at the time, but their goal was no less than to reshape all existing society as they, themselves, saw fit. By the end of the Second World War, it was already considered no longer feasible to apply a diplomatic approach toward global government. The military doomsday backup plan was put into effect. This was when Dwight D. Ike Eisenhower warned of the threat of the growing military-industrial complex. This is when black ops and black budget spending on them became vogue. Naturally, we do not have these shadow agencies under cover of umbrella corporations protected from the all-seeing eye under the wings of the eagle, so to speak, anymore. Now we have the DHS fiasco attempting to fix an intelligence community that was already functional, only being paid to look the other way on 9-11. This has effectively allowed many of the black ops to become rainbow ops, or those performed in or on the public. So what, then, was and is this military-industrial complex Ike warned us of? What is the interim like between the implementation of the military-industrial complex and 
and the DHS shakedown of all good cops following 9-11-2001. During the last century, from 1910 until 2010, the Federal Reserve Central Bank of the USA has held complete economic authority over the military-industrial complex's black budgets for their black op wars and black bag torture at black sites. The Federal Reserve Bank is the front business covering the money held by the CFR, Public Relations, portion of the Trilateral Commission, the military-industrial complex itself. The Bilderberg Group, under the Federal Reserve, the Fed, under the CFR, the CFR, under the Trilateral Commission, and the Trilateral Commission, under the Royal Institute of International Affairs, RIIA, and so on and so forth. The whole political chess game, as envisioned by Zbigniew Brzezinski, is purchased with credit on loan and paid for by the Federal Reserve, a privately owned bank with a no-bid, sole rights deal with the constitutional U.S. Republic. Here is the degree system used within the cult of the Federal Reserve. Quote, the Federal Reserve describes its structure as composed of five parts. One, the presidentially appointed Board of Governors, or Federal Reserve Board, an independent federal government agency located in Washington, D.C. Two, the Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC, composed of the seven members of the Federal Reserve Board and five of the twelve Federal Reserve Bank Presidents, which oversees open market operations, the principal tool of U.S. monetary policy. Three, twelve regional, privately owned Federal Reserve Banks located in major cities throughout the nation, which divide the nation into 12 Federal Reserve Districts. The Federal Reserve Banks act as fiscal agents for the U.S. Treasury, and each has its own nine-member board of directors. Four, numerous other private U.S. member banks which own required amounts of non-transferable stock in their regional Federal Reserve banks, and five various advisory councils. End quote. Even today, diligent efforts by congressmen like Ron Paul, attempting to make public the full accounting books of the Fed, are relentlessly blocked and slaughtered by a a predominantly Zionist Congress. And who, when we look at the bottom line, was behind the creation of the Fed, the CFR, the Treaty of Versailles, and the League of Nations, precursor to the UN? Here is a list of their names. Quote, a particularly severe panic in 1907 provided the motivation for renewed demands for banking and currency reform. The following year, Congress enacted the Aldrich Vreeland Act, which provided for an emergency currency and established the National Monetary Commission to study banking and currency reform. The chief of the bipartisan National Monetary Commission was financial expert and Senate Republican leader Nelson Aldrich. Aldrich set up two commissions, one to study the American monetary system in depth, and the other, headed by Aldrich himself, to study the European central banking systems and report on them. Aldrich went to Europe opposed to centralized banking, but after viewing Germany's banking system, he came away believing that a centralized bank was better than the government-issued bond system that he had previously supported. Centralized banking was met with much opposition from politicians who were suspicious of a central bank and who charged that Aldrich was biased due to his close ties to wealthy bankers such as J.P. Morgan and his daughter's marriage to John D. Rockefeller, Jr., in 1910, 
Aldrich and executives representing the banks of J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, and Kuhn, Loeb, and Company secluded themselves for 10 days at Jekyll Island, Georgia. The executives included Frank A. Vanderlip, president of the National City Bank of New York, associated with the Rockefellers, Henry Davison, senior partner of J.P. Morgan Company, Charles D. Norton, president of the First National Bank of New York, and Colonel Edward House, who would later become President Woodrow Wilson's closest advisor and founder of the Council on Foreign Relations. There, Paul Warburg and of Kuhn, Loeb, and Company directed the proceedings and wrote the primary features of what would be called the Aldrich Plan. Warburg would later write that the matter of a uniform discount rate, the interest rate, was discussed and settled at Jekyll Island. End quote. Nelson Aldrich was their primary political champion at the time of the passage on December 23, 1913, as Chapter 6, 38, Statute 251 of 12 U.S.C. Chapter 3, the Federal Reserve Act. The final wording of the act itself was taken from the Aldrich Plan, proposing a National Reserve Association with 15 regional district branches and 46 geographically dispersed directors. This differed from the final wording in the numbers of those who served at each level, but this three-tiered plan remained in place throughout the legislative history of the Fed Act, ever since its inception at the meeting on Jekyll Island between Aldrich and the wealthy industrialists and bankers of his time. These wealthy industrialists and bankers were all World War I profiteers who had no-bid government contracts supplying the military with weapons, vehicles, gas, etc. As such, they continued meeting, such as the May 19, 1919 meeting, to create the CFR held at the Majestic Hotel and continued founding further round table think tanks called by then trusts, such as those of the Carnegie Ford Scholarship Foundation or the International Endowment for the Arts.